Hello and welcome to The Wire at Primetime. I'm Siddharth Vardarajan and today we will be discussing a clutch of issues centered around the state of India's democracy. Joining me to discuss various aspects of India's democratic health, particularly given that we are five or six weeks away from a crucial Lok Sabha election is Anjali Bhardwaj, well-known democracy and rights activist, right to information activist, who is with the Satark Nagrik Sangathan, which has done a lot of work on the uh, electoral bonds issue uh, and in general fostering accountability in our in our political process. Uh, Anjali, welcome to The Wire. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Siddharth. Thanks for having me. You, you know, it's been an uphill struggle for you and your colleagues, uh, not just in the uh, in the SNS, but ADR and uh, you know Commodore Lokesh, but there are lots of sort of uh, I would say great heroic fighters for transparency on the election financing front. But at the end of the day, you have succeeded in large measure. There's still a bit of a caveat I'm introducing uh, because we don't know data preceding April 2019. But in large measure, you have succeeded in exposing before the public uh, details of who bought how many election bonds and gave it to which party and when did they do that. Uh, thanks to uh, your litigation, activism and so on, the government has been forced to concede this. The Supreme Court, of course, declared the electoral bond scheme unconstitutional and directed that this information be made public. The State Bank of India uh, tried its best to delay disclosure of information and we'll come to that in a second till the end of june but that didn't that didn't uh, they couldn't sustain that position and today we have pretty much all the data uh, about electoral bonds from april 2019 to now which accounts for roughly uh, perhaps 12 to 13000 crore uh, not the full 16000 crore data but a, but you know 80% of it uh, uh, to your mind as somebody who fought for this transparency and has now had some chance to go through the uh, the fine print of the details of what we know. Uh, to, to your mind, what are the two or three big biggest takeaways from the electoral bonds uh, scam, uh, which is pretty much what we should be calling it? Siddharth, from the very beginning, the issue really has been about people's right to know. And uh, if uh, I can just take your viewers back a little bit, before the electoral bonds were brought in, it was not as if we had a perfect system. There were problems. There was a reason why electoral funding, political party funding, was called the fountainhead of corruption in our country. There were two reasons primarily. One is that usually when companies give money to any political party, it is really to influence policy, to influence their decisions, to be able to get favors in return for the investment, so to speak, that they make. And that really is one of the most uh, prevalent ways globally for big ticket corruption. And that was one problem. The other was the secrecy in the entire funding process. And that was uh, in, in a large measure uh, through exploiting of a loophole which was there in the IT law, which basically the Income Tax Act in India says that any donation that's made to a political party, which is less than 20,000 rupees, the donor the name of the donor does not have to be disclosed by the political party. So now this was a loophole that was exploited very vastly. And th this is a very, very uh, widely open secret in a sense, because large companies would give very large cash donations to political parties, let's say 100 crore rupees. And these parties, not wanting to tell who was giving them the money, would just break it up into smaller packets of 19,900 rupees and say, look, many of our well-wishers have given us this money. So as voters, we were left in the dark. And this was a big problem. Now, when BJP came to power on the back of anti-corruption and promising greater accountability, transparency in political party funding, and they brought the idea of electoral bonds, there was excitement. People thought that since they were saying we are getting this for greater transparency to stop cash, flow of black money, etc., 
we thought that this will be a progressive instrument. But what it actually did was that it really just opened the floodgates of unlimited anonymous funding to political parties. So earlier, at least, all the money that one was the political parties were getting through the banking channel, people had a right to know. But now, uh, any amount, you know, 20,000 crore rupees could be transacted. And we are seeing that that is, the na that is about the kind of quantum that these bonds have uh, uh, been used to transact. We, have no, we had no idea who was giving the money and to whom. So what this was really doing was consolidating the role of big money in Indian politics. And what the Supreme Court has done is that in its judgment, it has upheld people's right to information, saying that electoral bond scheme and the various laws that were changed to bring in this scheme were all unconstitutional because they were violative of Article 19, free speech and expression. And the basic idea is that we, most people in our country go and vote for political parties, not so much candidates. Various reasons, Schedule 10, etc. It's not so much the candidates that are important, it's the parties. So when I go as a voter to vote, I should know who is getting money from whom, which political party is getting money from whom. Otherwise, I will have no idea who they will be working for once they're elected. And that's what the Supreme Court said, that as a voter, we have a right to know because there is quid pro quo. They've said it very clearly that these companies, large corporates are not giving money out of any public interest. They are doing it to maximize their profits. Right. Uh, you know, I was struck uh, a few days ago by an interview that uh, the Home Minister Amit Shah gave to one of these big channel conclaves. I think it was maybe TV18, uh, the, Mukesh, the Mukesh Ambani channel. Uh, and he was asked a question about electoral bonds and he made two or three uh, observations which I think are worth looking at. Uh, the first is he made he continues to insist that the uh, electoral bond scheme was well-intentioned. The idea was to stop black money and he said that before it happened, cash and we were donation to get the in the donation. But as you have explained, the electoral bond scheme uh, does nothing to stop the flow of cash and if anything actually has had made the situation worse because prior to the bonds being introduced, we at least knew the identity of those who wrote a check. We never knew who gave cash, but at least we knew the identity of who wrote a check. And thanks to Mr. Narendra Modi and Amit Shah and Arun Jaitley, the identity of even the check writers became uh, became hidden from us. So uh, I don't think Amit Shah's claim uh, really deserves uh, too much of uh, too much of attention. It seems very self-serving, but he said. Uh, he continues to insist that uh, uh, Bharti Janta Party ko sirf chhazar crore. Uh, he's going by the figure in the state bank account list, uh, uh, whereas by the BJP's own declarations to the election commission, the total amount received by the party is what about eight thousand two hundred crore. And he said details ane dijiye of vipakshi dal mu dekhane like nahi honge. And uh, now you've seen the list of names both for the Bharti Janta Party and the opposition. In your view, what does the identity of the donors tell us about the kind of politics that the Bharti Janta Party and, of course, other parties that run various state governments have been doing? So, Siddharth, let me, let me uh, sort of start by saying that there are two very uh, important issues that you have flagged, and I would ideally like to address both because I think it's very important. Uh, one is that uh, who all seem to have benefited and is when the Home Minister is saying that, you know, the BJP got 6,000 crore rupees, which uh, you're right, is more than 8,200 crores that they have got over the entire period. Uh, how significant is that? Now, first of all, uh, you know, very often we are also told that 16,500 rupees is not that much money in our political system. You know, each election in India costs a lot more. But if one looks at even what the uh, BJP has got in terms of electoral bonds, and you just look at the last year's declared income of the BJP, 54% of the declared income came through electoral bonds. Now, let's, let's uh, 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 you know, try and understand this. The fact is that today, 
political parties are running these very big machines and especially the bjp it's very glitzy election campaigns you know uh, the prime minister or the people getting off these uh, jets and so on they have to show that they got income to be able to spend it now if all the money keeps coming through cash it becomes a problem and one of the reasons why this was done was to basically say that we are getting a we are declaring money so that when big buildings are built you know their own office building or a, a big expenditure is incurred you are actually also able to show that you had got a lot of money so it is not insignificant in in uh, you know in the scheme of things 54% of the bjp's declared income came from electoral bonds just last year now when we talk about quid pro quo obviously when a company gives money and that's what the supreme court has said that they're giving it for a uh, for a favor in return and uh, basically they're saying that uh, this quid pro quo takes many forms and it therefore makes complete intuitive sense that it would be a ruling party a party in power that would be preferred because they are the ones who are able to influence policy make laws so when we see all the farmers sitting on the borders of delhi and saying that you are bringing farm laws but they are anti farmer who are you bringing them for and for the benefit of, of two or three uh, corporates you know it's very clear that these corporates do have a very great interest in influencing policy and laws also contracts so what the data is showing is that there are companies which had got electoral bonds very soon before or after they were given large contracts so that is really what otherwise is kickbacks so what we are seeing is legalizing institutionalizing the whole process and saying that you can just in totally anonymously give us money through bonds and then you know this can happen all of this of course is subject of a probe and investigation because everything will have to be established in a court of law but what is also being seen is how there are cases that have been opened by the investigating agencies like ed like the cbi the it department and then when there are raids and there is investigation around that time there are large amounts of bonds that are bought and that are given to the ruling party now the ruling party at the center of course is the bjp and in regional parties are there in the states and we are seeing how bonds have gone to different parties uh, the wire uh, you all have also done some fantastic analysis of that data that has come out now and it is really pointing towards with very clear data towards the kind of thing that we have been talking about for the last 7 years even in the court when we consistently said that look this is really just an instrument of legalizing this kind of big ticket corruption this you know that is what is now being borne out by the data which will need investigation to be able to get to the bottom of each of these cases now what uh, does the home minister and it's not just the home minister he said it in that conclave but it's something that is being repeated by the ministers that the supreme court failed to see how we were trying to improve the system we were making a bad system better by saying that you can't give cash and just giving the donors uh, this option of remaining anonymous and giving us money through the banking channels therefore cash was getting reduced now this is exactly the point that the supreme court tackled in the entire hearing the supreme court asked a simple question to the solicitor general the when they said that look you know cash is being removed there is something very good happening here don't throw the baby out with the bath water etc the court asked a simple question they said are you all not accepting cash now and the answer was no because when the electoral bond scheme was brought in it's not as if parties were stopped from accepting cash so cash transactions went on second which is even more important is that the court asked the straight and simple question that can these bonds be traded and while on paper in the scheme the bonds are prohibited from being traded in 
actual practice, because there were no safeguards, the bonds could be traded for a consideration. So what that meant is that somebody buys it, gives their KYC, and buys it in the banking channel, but then sells it, takes cash instead. And then the donor, the actual donor, is giving it to a political party. So what is happening is not just cash, the cash economy sustaining very well, but in fact, money laundering. And now, as far as intention is concerned, when you said that the Home Minister said it was very well intentioned, one might have even believed that. But we accessed under the Right to Information Act, there were communication from the RBI, from the ECI, clearly telling the finance ministry exactly this, saying that you are actually starting a system which will make black money and cash prosper even more. So this particular contention is really not, you know, be, uh, it's not borne out at all from all the communication and everything that has happened both in the courts and between institutions. Right. Uh, you know, some of the patterns, I'm, I'm looking at the identity of donors, uh, uh, India's sort of lottery king, uh, Santiago Martin's company, Future Gaming, given huge amounts of money to the DMK, which is the ruling party in the state where the company is based, uh, and the Trinamool Congress in West Bengal, where the party does a lot of business. Uh, and of course, it's also given 100 crore uh, to the Bharti Janta Party. Uh, this is a company that uh, had been raided by the Enforcement Directorate. Uh, some of its assets had been seized. So it's not as if the Bharati Janata Party was unaware of the uh, nature of this company and uh, its questionable sort of dealings. Um, you know, even if we're not able to establish uh, quid pro quo or some kind of a shakedown, right, where where a company is raided in exchange for and then it then it ponies up cash, uh, on 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 the on grounds of morality alone, uh, where does where does this leave the Bharati Janata Party? I mean, you're taking money from a company that uh, you know to be uh, operating on the margin, on the margins of law, margins of the law, and uh, yet you insist that you're a party with a difference. The prime minister says, "Na khaunga, na khani dunga." Uh, somewhere down the line, it's very hard to square all of these uh, all of these claims with with the identity of the donors, is it? Uh, Siddharth, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's something that, uh, you know, uh, we've been saying that just a government claiming that there is no corruption or that corruption has gone down significantly means nothing. What we are seeing actually now are potentially very, very strong cases of big ticket corruption that are surfacing, which will need a very fair probe to be done. And all these claims of, you know, Abhrashtachar Mukt Bharat or Nakhaunga Nakhane Dunga actually are only, uh, can only be substantiated when all of these are properly investigated. So if you look at the kind of uh, action that has happened by the Enforcement Directorate or the CBI uh, or the IT, uh, you know, there could be two kinds of uh, allegations that come up. One is extortion, where an agency might be used by uh, those who control it, uh, which is the ruling party at the center, who is then, uh, in a sense, wielding that to be able to extract money from someone who is being in investigated. The other is, if there was indeed a problem with that company and there was an investigation happening, did that investigation go into cold storage after the money was given? So there is this, both the element of extortion and of quid pro quo that actually uh, could could be made in in many of these cases. So of course these these are cases where you know uh, we have been hearing that we are a party with a difference. The, it will have to be examined now. Each of these claims will have to be examined. I'm not just talking about uh, the BJP. I'm even saying the opposition parties that would have got money or the other ruling parties in the states that would have got money would have a lot to answer for, and there would uh, have to be investigations to really get down to the bottom of things. But what uh, I also want to bring in here is the whole issue of institutional capture that this entire saga is revealing. Uh, start from the SBI. 
what is the reason that the SBI is dragging its feet the way we have seen it since the Supreme Court has given its orders? We have discussed this so often that there was no need for the SBI to come back and ask for the kind of time that it did, nearly four months, when they could have brought this data out in four days or maybe even less, because they were clearly digitizing everything. And only yeah. when the, the Supreme Court came down heavily and said there is no way that we are going to let you wait till after elections to give this data. They are very quickly able to generate all this data and share it and put it in a digital form, uh, you know, in front of us. So what what is happening to the largest financial institution in our country? What is happening to the ED, the CBI? The I, I mean, these are the premier investigating institutions in our in our country. Again, the Supreme Court. I mean, I'm sorry, this is a fabulous judgment, but look at the timing of it. This case has been ongoing for more than six years. Why did it take the apex court in our country to come down heavily and say, no, this is unconstitutional? We have had one general election in 2019 using funds through electoral bonds. We have had so many state elections, and now we are going into another general election for which money has been collected through electoral bonds. So I think what is happening to our institutions, and it links up to the whole question of what's happening to our democracy, because our democracy can only be as robust as the institutions yeah. that support yeah. it. Yeah. So, so, so you raise an interesting uh, issue, which I was going to get to anyway, but you know, since you've spoken of the SBI, I mean, the bank claimed that this data was held in, in two sil separate silos. As we know, uh, it took all of us in the media literally a couple of hours messing around with an Excel sheet in order to marry these two silos and produce one printout of uh, which, which company gave money to which party. Uh, so it's astonishing that the SBI would have made this kind of claim. And I think in any country which believes in rule of law and in public morality, uh, the SBI leadership really ought to be looking at uh, not just contempt of court charges, but, but I think th this raises a question as to whether the SBI is part of a conspiracy to, to keep data hidden from the public. If so, who, were, who all were part of this conspiracy? Who prompted the SBI? Was the SBI, which reports to the finance ministry, uh, in any way pressured to, to take this kind of absurd position? Uh, you know, in any, uh, you know, frankly, the, the the Supreme Court, which has dragged its feet, as you say, for five years, and, you know, the the chief justices who really need to shoulder their share of the blame, uh, Ranjan Gogoi, um, Justice Bobde, uh, you know, uh, uh, Lalit, Ramana, these are people who failed to make it a priority, uh, even as they were prioritizing other cases that were not so important to the body politic. Uh, but perhaps the Supreme Court can redeem its honor by, A, insisting that data prior to April 2019 also be made public. In fact, the court had itself directed the Election Commission to extract this information from political parties, and most parties ignored that demand. And B, you know, ordering an, an investigation into this conspiracy to, to keep this information suppressed. Uh, I think that uh, if the ED and... and and CBI and, and IT department were to be uh, uh, were to set up a court monitored investigation into uh, what made the State Bank of India submit that bizarre affidavit and and demand greater time. You know, a lot of uncomfortable secrets may tumble out. But uh, just jumping on from that, uh, uh, Anjali, we've seen over the last twenty four hours, uh, last twelve hours, in fact, the arrest of Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal in a matter pertaining to actually quid pro quo, right? That's the allegation. The, the allegation is that Delhi's, the Delhi government's liquor policy uh, was altered in such a way as to favor private parties. So there's an allegation of a policy change being taken at the instance of companies that then presumably gave money either to uh, Aam Aadmi Party leaders individually or to the party as a whole. Let's leave aside the fact that so far the ED has not been able to uh, provide evidence of the money trail. But the electoral bond scheme and what we know uh, should be the grounds for opening hundreds of ED investigations, surely, where, uh, you know, uh, in other words, trying to match policy decisions taken by the union government and by different state governments, 
uh, with donations made when they were made. Uh, you know, the, uh, any any honest set of investigators would have a field day, and frankly, it may not even take them all that much time to to unravel. Uh, you know, dozens and dozens of stories of corruption. I mean, I was astonished at the Orissa data, uh, where the Biju Janata Dal. I think. 95% of its donations came from large mining companies. And we know that the uh, Odisha government runs the most big miner friendly uh, government possible. Tribals are, Adivasis are evicted from their lands and the norms of, of mining have become easier and easier. Uh, so there's, you know, we're talking of very significant decisions being taken at different levels by governments uh, who, have, who have also received money uh, through this anonymous route. Uh, so really, if they were, you know, uh, you know, if if the government is serious about corruption, then what what's being what Arvind Kejriwal has been subjected to uh, would be uh, would be would be you know you need to do the same thing against each and every one of these companies and each and every one of these parties that seems to have taken huge amounts of money from you know and, and we need to understand the reasons for this. <clears throat> yes, that's right. And uh, I mean, I would I would say that the question today facing us as citizens is who's going to investigate the investigators? Because we are seeing how the ED, the CBI and the IT department, their where they are investigating is also are also companies who are themselves buying electoral bonds and giving them uh, to uh, various parties, including the BJP, the ruling BJP. So in many ways, now the role of the investigators, the, the very ED that you're talking about, Siddharth, uh, comes under a big uh, a, a question mark because somebody will need to now investigate what was the role that they were playing if they were seen to go slow after electoral bonds were being do, uh, were being bought and donated. So I think what is required here is a very, very independent probe. It will have to be independent. It will have to be empowered. Now, the question then becomes who will do it? Of yeah. course, there is the need and the talk, there is talk about a court monitored SIT to look into this. It's it's very sad. So, uh, I mean, you know, the whole demand for a Lokpal, for example, uh, as a lot of people would remember, was precisely this, that, you know, the CBI and the other investigating agencies are not independent enough. We need an empowered and independent body to look into cases of corruption. What is the Lokpal doing? And uh, I think what we are seeing right now, like I mentioned, is the very, very perverse kind of, um, you know, institutional capture of, of uh, sort of breaking down the independence of these institutions that are supposed to function to be able to actually investigate corruption, not just at the lower levels, but actually happening at the highest levels. Now, we yeah. need an investigation into all of these. And since you mentioned the case of the liquor policy, I mean, your own uh, data crunching, which I've seen the wire do and, and several others also do, uh, it, one of the uh, donors seems to be this Aurobindo company, which is really, uh, you know, the owner or, or one of the directors is the approver in this particular case. And after he gets arrested, there is five crore rupees piece worth electoral bonds that are bought within a few within a few days or a week and that that after that he gets bail which is not opposed by the enforcement directorate and then after that he turns approver now and then after turning approver they they donate another large chunk about more than 25 uh, crore rupees to the bjp now some of these things ought to really raise concerns among citizens and we don't have to be uh, sympathizers of the Ahmadmi Party or the BJP or the Congress or TMC or anyone. It's really about it's really democracy at stake here because we are talking about uh, a rule of law. We are talking about corruption, big ticket corruption, and finally we are talking about the health of our institutions, without which democracy can't stand. Yeah, uh, Anjali, you spoke about institutional capture. And I think uh, this is a uh, this is a question on which we will have to uh, end our discussion sadly because our half hour is up. But the Lokpal is in the is in the hands of Justice Khan Wilkar, who delivered a whole bunch of very controversial judgments and clearly was given the uh, Lokpal job as a, as a kind of reward. 
the national human rights commission is in cha- is has been entrusted to justice arun mishra another equally uh, uh, controversial judge you have people selected for election commission members of the election commission who who have, have had a very very close working relationship with senior bjp leaders uh, including the home minister amit shah uh, all of which raises questions about how independent in this run up to the election uh, will the election commission be how level will the playing field be, playing field be we know on the basis of the electoral bonds data and other money data that the bharatiya janata party goes into this election with uh, a much much larger war chest than any of its rivals uh, and it also goes into this election uh, with uh, institutions that are meant to monitor the elections uh, staffed with people who are rather well disposed towards the bjp and it goes into this election in a situation where uh, many of the agencies that report to the executive have already uh, acted in a in a very arbitrary fashion targeting the opposition and ensuring that they are not able to campaign at the fullest level uh you know so 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 these are all concerns that uh, that exist in the public domain about the uh upcoming elections uh, today we focused on electoral bonds uh, anjali bhardwaj you and your colleagues have played a stellar role in bringing uh, uh, this information out so congratulations and thank you very much on behalf of all our viewers and of course thank you for being with us for this program today thank you thanks adat